Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. So we've talked about compost making on many different fronts on this channel, but today let's talk about potential ways to simply level up your compost making or compost in general. Maybe you bought a meh compost or maybe you are getting ready to make another round or maybe you have a pile just sitting there that needs a little something extra. Well, in this video, we're going to discuss several different ways to enhance or improve compost no matter what part of the process you're in. So let's do it. Let's also get Farmer Jesse some coffee because clearly I need some caffeine. Okay, so assuming you all are game to get real nerdy today, the first thing I want to discuss in terms of enhancing your compost is the addition of biochar. Uh, for the uninitiated, biochar is a granular charcoal-like amendment that is produced by burning carbonaceous material like wood chips or grasses or something in that vein. Or it could be manures, basically anything with carbon in it. And you burn it at high temperatures but low oxygen. This process essentially creates an incredibly stable, like lasting thousands of years, stable, uh, incredibly stable and porous material with a very high ability to retain water and plant available nutrients. Uh, biochar is of course not new, the, with the roots dating back thousands of years to indigenous people that span the globe from West Africa to Peru, and of course the famous terra preta, created by a combination of charcoals, sometimes pottery and organic matter all mixed together. Um, these Brazilian soils are famously fertile in an area that is not known for having particularly fertile soils, which is typical in tropical regions with heavy rainfalls that often deplete the nutrients. Terra preta soils are still fertile even now, thousands of years later, which is where the enthusiasm for biochar sort of originates. There is a profound amount of research out there about biochar and even adding biochar to compost, both after compost is produced uh, and as a raw ingredient in the composting process. Honestly, I could make this whole video on the subject of biochar research because it's endlessly fascinating, but the TLDR version is that adding biochar to compost improves the compost in a variety of ways from absorbing excess ammonia to balancing moisture and pH to even helping speed up and extend the thermophilic or the hot period, uh, which can potentially help with maturation as well as weed seed and disease suppression. Now, Usually biochar is added at a very high rate of 10 to 20% of the compost by volume as a raw carbon ingredient, but it can also be added at the end or during the process at smaller levels if you just want a little bit of nutrient retention. Adding biochar to compost is an especially good idea if all you have is raw, unactivated, essentially not inoculated biochar because raw biochar can lock up soil nutrients if applied straight to the soil. Anyway, I promise more on biochar in the future because I'm having an embarrassingly good time reading the research. But for now, let's move on to another option for enhancing compost, rock minerals and micronutrients. Now, I'm not a big soil balancing proponent necessarily because well, the research on it is pretty mixed on the efficacy of adding rock powders to soil. That said, nutrient deficiencies do happen and rather than addressing them with rock minerals applied to the soil surface where they can take eons or more accurately something like a year to become plant available, I like to address deficiencies through compost. A recommendation I got reading Brian O'Hara's book, No-Till Intensive Vegetable Culture, which is excellent. Uh, the reason I like running rock minerals and things like kelp through compost before applying it to the soil is that plants can't really eat rock minerals. Plants need a microbe to use its little keys called enzymes to unlock that nutrient, whatever nutrients it needs, from rock minerals before the plant can utilize that nutrient. Uh, therefore, adding rock minerals to soil is a very slow path to correcting plant deficiencies. Adding those same rock minerals to a compost pile, however, where the microbiology is, and excuse the jargon, going absolutely bonkers can help make the deficient nutrients available much more rapidly. There is some research to back this up, but it's a bit thinner than something like biochar. Anecdotally, uh, I have corrected blossom end rot in peppers, a known calcium deficiency, with a compost to which I added heavily crushed eggshells, uh, the smaller the better, for one week. Uh, I dug a, a light four inch trench down the middle of the bed and filled it with the compost and then covered it back up. Within days, the plants were dark green and the blossom end rot was completely gone. Again, not science, but for me, it was convincing enough. Uh, so anyway, at least consider adding rock minerals to compost if you're seeing deficiencies in your soil as one option. For application rates, less is usually more with this stuff because you don't want to throw off other nutrients, just make sure whatever you add to your compost pile is well incorporated. I like adding a little bit throughout the pile as I turn it, that just gets it in there nice and even. 
Real quick, there is only so much I can cover in a video. So if you really want a robust roadmap for using compost in the no-till garden, pick up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com, which also conveniently helps support more videos like this. So good on you. Next way to enhance compost, or at least make a very dynamic compost, is to consider some of the practices outlined by Dr. Cho Han Q, sometimes just referred to as Master Cho uh, or Dr. Cho, with Korean natural farming. Uh, such as the IMO or Indigenous Microorganisms Collection. The IMO collection involves boiling rice, setting it in an old forest protected from critters and rain, and collecting some fungal growth, then using that as the base to make a very specific but really robust compost. There's, of course, a lot more to the practice, but that's the idea. Now, notably, there is not a ton of research comparing KNF's IMO preparation to other forms of composting that I can find, or at least that are in English, um, but I have done this sort of IMO collection several times, and the IMO collection does make a really nice and interesting compost. Like it smells and feels different from your average compost. It makes a really nice inoculating compost in general, a term sort of outlined in the Living Soil Handbook and elsewhere on this channel. And you can always just add the IMO collection to other compost piles once you have it stabilized in brown sugar. Uh, Chris Trump has the most helpful series of videos I've seen on this subject, which I'll link in the show notes. I do hope for more research on KNF in the future, but play around with it and see what you think, uh, especially if you're a researcher. That would be super helpful. Thanks. Okay, another option for leveling up compost is simply finishing your compost with worms. I love worms. Worms have extraordinary guts, which I don't say that about everybody, capable of increasing the nutrient content and microbial diversity of composts, buffering the pH while digesting some pathogenic organisms, and increasing that material's water holding capacity. And that is such an abbreviated, oversimplified list of what earthworms do to the stuff they ingest as to almost be insulting. But it's good to make the compost first in the traditional thermophilic manner as described in this video here. For instance, we'll see if YouTube hooks it up with a link here. The thermophilic or the hot part of the composting process helps eliminate the weed seeds, as I mentioned earlier, and some of the pathogenic organisms. Um, and then the worms sort of reinstall the good stuff. Composting is sort of like pasteurization while also being the complete opposite at the same time. Okay, this seems like something I would have put at the beginning of this video, but I cannot emphasize enough the importance of using a diversity of inputs in making good, balanced, rich, and microbially diverse compost. For instance, chicken manure is known for its high nitrogen, but chicken manure is also dominated by different fungi and bacteria than, say, goat manure, which itself is dominated by different microbes than, say, cow or horse horse manure, and so on. Um, the quality and diversity is, of course, driven by the animal's diets, but using a variety of manures and other nitrogen sources, as well as a variety of carbon sources from wood chips to straw and so on, that's what makes a really rich and robust compost. Um, we can never assume we know what plants need or soil needs at any given moment, so having a, as diverse of a compost as possible is the best way to ensure we get the soil and plants what they need. Okay, before I get to the last way to enhance your compost, if you enjoy these videos, please consider supporting them and all of our work at patreon.com slash no-till growers. Uh, Patreon support really makes no-till growers possible and has for many years now. Alternatively, you can just snag a hat or a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com or hit that super thanks button that helps too. Okay, so the last way to enhance compost is not going to sound like something particularly um, surprising or revolutionary, but the research around it is actually pretty interesting. That ingredient? Time, or more specifically, maturation. Before you're like, nah, that's not very interesting, the science there is actually pretty cool. So the thing is that immature composts can have a wide diversity of microbes, but they can also contain and support disease-causing organisms. Uh, mature composts, loosely defined as composts that have fulfilled their thermophilic, again, the hot stage, and been allowed to rest, leveling out at roughly 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio if you want to get technical. The particles in mature compost tend to be smaller, which makes it easier for microbes to release those particles and nutrients. Um, mature compost may be more stable in terms of pH, favor more beneficial organisms. I'm also as guilty as anyone of using compost that is perhaps a little bit immature than I should have, but the advantages of waiting until the compost is fully mature are not small. Conversely, you don't want to use a compost that has matured to the point of not having anything left to offer to the soil beyond leach out 
you know, organic matter, like a pile that's just really old and has been sitting there for a long time, you probably want to avoid. Probably has some weed seeds and probably won't add a lot to your soil beyond just maybe some organic matter, which isn't the worst thing. Knowing when a compost pile is totally mature is a little complicated and subjective, but generally what I recommend is waiting very least a few weeks after the thermophilic stages have ended if the material you used was very large, like large wood chips, then maturation will take longer than for, say, shredded straw. Um, compost should feel crumbly, plus smell rich, and truly not anything like manure. A good general timeline is three to six months total, though six months is the safer bet. That's why I like to make compost in the fall, then use it in the spring. It's a good maturation period. Anyway, let me know what you would have added, subtracted, or multiplied from this list. Oh, I guess you do use math after high school. Like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Otherwise, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. We've talked about compost making on Kitty Cat. In case you've missed her. I know. You're the worst. You're the worst. Kitty Cat, no. Kitty Cat. Kitty Cat, stop. You're gonna shake the camera. Stop. Kitty, stop. <clears throat> Kitty Cat, you have to quit.